Hello, um, my name is Madison Burgess and I currently go to Ogden International High School and I'm in the 12th grade. Uh, I've lived in Chicago my entire life and I'm currently enrolled in the IB program, specifically IB psychology and I hope to study psychology in college. Outside of school, I'm interested in things like photography, creative writing, um, and poetry, and I'm very glad to be here today. Hi, um, I'm Faith Gay. Um, I am a 12th grader that goes to Ogden International High School. I'm an IB psychology student, and um, because of my love for STEM, I aspire to be a mechanical engineer one day. Um, what I like to do in my free time is watch films and then watch videos about the films, analyzing them. So, because I like the deeper meaning of things. <laughs> and I'm really excited to be here today and to listen to what you have to say. Um, so for our first question, we wanted to ask, um, what is the meaning crisis and how does it affect high school students? So um, the main idea is that the dynamic processes that make us intelligently adaptive also make us perennially susceptible to self-deception. I'll just give you a quick example. Um, so to be adaptive, you have to you have to exercise selective attention. You can't pay attention to everything in this room and you know all of the information. What's, so you have to ignore a lot of it, or else you would just overwhelm your your processing. That's how to be adaptive. But the problem is when you ignore it, it can cause you to misinterpret or misframe the situation. You can realize that you've misframed the situation when you have like an aha moment. You say, "Oh." Oh, I, I, I thought she was angry, but it turns out she was just anxious. I misframed it. And you realize that that adaptive framing can sometimes lead you uh, to deceive yourself about what's going on. <clears throat> so across historical contexts, cultural contexts, people have tried to generate ecologies of practices, sort of living systems of different practices uh, for ameliorating that self-deception. And also for doing something else, that, that, that adaptivity, it's not sort of cold calculation. It's, uh, it's very much how you are connected to the world, how if you're properly connected to yourself, to other people, uh, to the environment. Th that sense of connectedness is what people are talking about when they're talking about how meaningful their life is. They don't mean how many sentences do they possess. They mean what makes their life worth living given the inevitable failures and frustrations uh, 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 that you know that human life is is subject to, and so people have come up with ecologies of practices for reducing the self deception and enhancing the connectedness, and that's called that's generally what we mean by wisdom. And the problem is those ecologies of practices and wisdom they have to be housed, they have to be homed, I should say, in a setting that makes sense of them and fits them into the wider cultural context. So if I ask you, where do you go for? information, what might you say to me? The internet. Right. Where would you go for knowledge? Um, the internet. Where would you go for wisdom? I don't know. I don't try to seek wisdom anywhere. And where would you go for wisdom? Um, well, I'm religious, so I would probably go to my church. Right. Leaders there. Right, right. So for most people, they either say, I don't seek, or they go into a religious setting. But given that for uh, the largest demographic group, and especially of young people, are called the nuns, not N-U-N, N-O-N-E-S. That means they have no official religious identity. And so they do not have a place to go. Now, the thing that where this affects both of you in high schools is you say you don't seek wisdom, and I understand, um, but there's a sense in which wisdom is not optional for you. Like, like you, if you don't, try to address issues of self-deception, self-destructive behavior, right? They're going, to, they're going to take root and grow. And, and that's why you see a lot of the issues around mental health issues, alienation issues, uh, addiction issues for young people. Because if those things are not addressed, they take on a life of their own and they, and they, they can make people feel very cut off and severed. Uh, so for example, the average number of friends that people have is going down even though they have more connections. Um, the overall uh, measures of, of sadness in the world are increasing, independent of how wealthy people are. Um, uh, loneliness is significant. Um, there, was a, there was a survey in England 
in 2019, and 89% of the people there said they found that their lives were meaningless. So this is this is really important. It's, uh, and so, have you ever noticed that your friends can get caught up and they're making that sort of same mistake with like their romantic relationships, and you can see it from the outside really well. Yeah. But when it's you, you can't see it so well, right? Yeah. See, wisdom isn't optional. Wouldn't you want to be better at, wouldn't you want to like to be as wise with yourself as you are with your friends? Yeah, I would. Yeah. Because you don't want to make the same mistakes as them and you don't want to be sad like you just said. Yeah. Loneliness is part of everybody's life, so I wouldn't want to have that. So the meaning crisis is, unlike many other cultures, People don't have, if they're not religious, people don't have a place to go in order to address these concerns. And so they try to get whatever clues they can from popular culture and entertainment. And those are really crappy clues for uh, the cultivation of wisdom, meaning in life. Do you think that you're religious? And I'm not anti-religious by any means. Do you feel that your, your religious home is helping you on these issues? In some cases, yes. I think that my religious home is a space where I can go and ask questions about what is the meaning of life? What is our purpose here? I think it is a space where I can be with other people that think similar, um, but also we can challenge each other and grow as people and as human beings. Um, it's a very safe and loving and nurturing space that I think I'm able to become a better person mm -hmm. while being in that space. But I know that that's not necessarily the same for all religious people. I do know religious people who don't go to church or who do find that community and, um, elsewhere, mm -hmm. whether that be just other friends or other type of religious spaces. Um, but I think as long as you have that, uh, no matter where it comes from, it's still very important to who we are as human beings. We're meant to live with each other. And the United States is one of the most religious countries in the world uh, compared to many other countries. Uh, but uh, it is actually getting increasingly less religious uh, with, with each decade. Mm -hmm. So the problem I'm talking about is, is, is going to grow and grow within the United States as it's growing in the rest of the world. But, but I shouldn't be asking the questions. I should let you ask questions. Do you think, uh, this is a follow-up question to uh, the one that we or just discussing, but do you think that there is another answer that, do you think that religion is the sole answer or is it something else? Uh, well, for many people, religion is clearly not the answer. Um, and also for many people, which you admitted, many people even within religious context are not satisfied uh, that the religion is providing them with the tools to train um, the skills and the virtues. Uh, that are needed for addressing foolishness and enhancing that sense of connectedness. Um, I also, I want to say this very carefully because I have a, I have a very deep and abiding respect with, uh, with uh, uh, people of faith and religion. Um, I have very important relationships with them. Um, religion is having a problem I would say, dealing with the scientific worldview um, and figuring out how to appropriately fit itself in. And when you say science, I, 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 you may, you may think, when you hear science, you may think I'm talking about sort of abstract. I'm talking about the fact that, okay, the internet, which you're going for most of everything, right? Um, none of the religions seem to be understanding the tremendous impact that is already happening and coming from social media. They don't seem to be addressing how to prepare people for the particular challenges of that environment. Mm -hmm. Artificial intelligence is coming. I know, I do work in this area. Do you feel your religion is talking about this as, at all or thinking about it at all? I definitely think that young people are. Right, and, okay, say, say more. Um, Especially when I've noticed when I talk to my friends that are Christian that are like around my age, we tend to talk about how social media plays into our lives and how it plays into our faith um, because a lot of us use it. Uh, it's been used to 
social media has been used to like critique Christianity as well as like promote it. So it's very, very diverse in uh, their ways of talking about religion. I think that older people are just now starting to realize like, oh, this is this is something that we're going to have to address within the church because it is something that is greatly affecting young people. The use of internet, the constant use of phones, everything like that, and just looking for a community, but that not being a real community because you can't really find a strong community through the internet. But I think that the church is slowly getting there. I know that my church has had conversations about these That's things, great. but I don't, I can't speak for all churches, so I don't know um, exactly. In general, I mean, uh, it, first of all, it, what you described is in general the case. People are talking about it, the individuals, but the institution does not seem to be at the level of, you know, theology and philosophy. It's not generating any deep responses, uh, as far as I can see. Um, and, and, and then, of course, like I said, when we get autonomous AI, like uh, artificial intelligence that is as intelligent as we are, that's going to have more of an impact on our culture than the Industrial Revolution. It, and it, it seems plausible to me to, that that will be a, a, a like a profound religious crisis for many people. Uh, what does that mean if you have these machines mm -hmm. that can do exactly what human beings can do or better? Um, and, and again, I don't see uh, the, the existing world religions seriously wrestling with these kinds of issues. So that's why I'm concerned. I want to answer you very, very, in a somewhat complex ma manner, Madison. Though, like if people from my work return, and many people do, to the, their faith, you know, and if they find it strengthened, great. Uh, like I don't, I don't have, I'm just answering your question. I don't see the religions as institutions addressing these crucial issues that are so rapidly undermining. Uh, the, the 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 threads of, of meaning that are left and so exacerbating self-deceptive, self-destructive behavior. The mental health issues that are being exacerbated by social media are significant. You you were translating that uh, that the kind of development with AI will might probably be a crisis situation for the religions. Yes. But how do you see? Could it be also a crisis situation for science? Cause the kind of yeah. science, it's the, it's the kind of propositional knowing the, the kind of scientific cognitive way of knowing that has been the kind of in the core of science in a way. And if the artificial intelligence is much more faster and more reliable to deal with that, what is it that's left for, for our, us humans? Um, it's a great question. I mean, there's multiple points there. First of all, we're making progress in AI, the degree to which we're moving away from trying to create AI solely focused on propositional knowing. Increased emphasis on procedural knowing and the beginnings of perspectival knowing. It has to go much farther into participatory knowing. Uh, but what's happening is the AI is more and more uh, demonstrating how, how, it, how central to our intelligence the non-propositional ways of knowing are. Um, so. I think that uh, what AI is doing paradoxically is showing us <clears throat> how much of our cognition is actually not represented in the practice of science, but, uh, but how much of our cognition is presupposed in the practice of science. And that's, I think, that has, I think, for example, that has a spiritual significance of, I think it really does, uh, because it tells us fundamentally uh, something different about the nature of who we are what the nature of the self is, how we operate as cognitive agents. There's a, there's, I have a lot of criticisms of current AI, so I'm going to presume, just for the sake of answering your question, that those criticisms have been addressed. For example, we shouldn't be just making artificial intelligence, we should be making an artificial rationality, artificial wisdom, and that has to be grounded in, in artificial autopoiesis, artificial life. The kind of machines we have right now will not, the way they are, they can't get there. All of that being said, um, there might be nothing for us to do. If we're making artificial intelligence without giving these machines, because intelligence is only weakly predictive of rationality, even, even less predictive of wisdom. So if we just make them really intelligent, they can be like many people you know who are re really intelligent and very foolish and self-deceptive. We'll make machines that are just more powerful at being intelligent fools. That's immoral. I think that's immoral. Not only for us, but to them, if they're if they're cogn cogn 
uh, cognitive beings. But let's say we solve all of that, and then they're genuinely wise. They're silicon sages. We don't. I can't see any moral argument we could raise for not making them, other than just blind self-interest, which is never the basis for any moral argument, as far as I can tell. So it's like, well, I don't want to make them because they're going to replace us because they're morally superior. What's your argument? So th- I think that's a problem we're going to face if, and these are big ifs, if people address some of the criticisms I've been making. We can't wait till it happens to prepare people for it because it will happen so fast and it will accelerate that we s- we'll just wait until it happens and then we'll figure out we'll be overtaken. It'll be like a tsunami hitting us culturally. We have to start doing it now. And I don't see mo- I don't see any significant institution, religious or secular, that's doing that. Now, I, I know lots of people and lots of groups and I'm working with that are trying to do that. Kind of hearing a call for education systems too. T- totally. I mean, it's, it, education has to move away from sort of the here now orientation to the marketplace back towards a, a, a much longer intergenerational project in order to deal with these kinds of looming threats. Mm-hmm.